Good morning to each of you. It's a great privilege to be part of this distinguished forum, this banquet of the heart, soul, and mind, and to participate in this wonderful set of conversations of which we've been a part. I want to thank our friends at the Lumen Christi and the Civil and Human Rights Program uh, for their choreography of these proceedings and for bringing us together uh, with such alacrity. I also want to thank them for their charity in allowing a mere Protestant to stand in front of these Catholic divines uh, who are gathered here. A sense of the dignity of the human person has been impressing itself more and more deeply on the consciousness of contemporary man. And the demand is increasingly made that men should act on their own judgment, enjoying and making use of a responsible freedom, not driven by coercion, but motivated by a sense of duty. This is the preface to Dignitatis Humanae of 1965, authored by Pope Paul VI. This was an historic statement about human dignity, signaling a momentous swing in the pendulum of world opinion. Only two decades before, the world had stared in horror into Hitler's death camps and Stalin's gulags, where all sense of humanity and dignity had been brutally sacrificed. In response, the world had seized anew on the ancient concept of human dignity, claiming this as the new Ur principle of world order and world peace. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 opened its preamble with what would become classic words, and I quote, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. By the mid-1960s, church and state alike had translated this general principle of human dignity into concrete human precepts, as we heard already in our first panel this morning. In Pacum and Terris and Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Space and many other documents produced in and around the Second Vatican Council. The Roman Catholic Church took some of the decisive first steps in the world, abandoning its program of the syllabus of errors of a century before and embracing a centuries-long engagement with human rights that go back to the 12th, 13th, and 14th century medieval scholastics and canonists and were fully formed in the 16th and 17th century by the Spanish neo-scholastics and their articulation of a rights framework. Every person, Pacum and Terrace in 1963 now taught, is created by God with dignity and intelligence and free will and has rights flowing directly and simultaneously from his very nature. Such rights, as we heard already in the last panel, include the rights to life and adequate standards of living, to moral and cultural values, to religious activities, to assembly and association, to marriage and family life, and to various social, political, and economic benefits and opportunities. The church emphasized the religious rights of conscience, worship, assembly, and education, calling them the first rights of any civic order. The church also stressed the need to balance individual and associational rights, particularly those of the church, the family, and the school. Governments everywhere were encouraged to instantiate human rights and to root out discrimination. Within a decade, various ecumenical groups, some Protestants and a few Orthodox Christian groups, crafted comparable comprehensive declarations of human rights, albeit with different emphases on issues of human dignity. Not only the world's churches, but also the United Nations and several nation states issued a number of landmark documents on human dignity and human rights in the 1960s. Foremost amongst these were the two great international covenants promulgated by the United Nations in 1966. Both these covenants took as their starting point the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family and the belief that such rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. The International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights posed as essential to human dignity, the right to self-determination, subsistence, work, welfare, security, education, and various forms of participation in cultural life. 
The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights set out a long catalog of rights to life and the security of person and property, freedom from slavery and cruelty, basic civil and criminal procedural protections, rights to travel and pilgrimage, freedom of religion, expression and assembly, rights to marriage and family life, and freedom from discrimination on various grounds which are amplified in subsequent instruments. All this was based on an elaboration of a concept of human dignity. So matters stood 50 years ago. Today the concept of dignity has become ubiquitous to the point of cliché, a moral trump frayed by heavy use, a general principle harried by constant invocation. In the past 50 years, there have been hundreds of books and tens of thousands of articles on dignity. We now read regularly of the dignity of animals and plants and nature, the dignity of luxury, pleasure, and leisure, the dignity of poverty, pain, and imprisonment, the dignity of identity, belonging, and difference, the dignity of ethnic, cultural, linguistic purity, the dignity of contraception, abortion, and euthanasia, the dignity of sex and sexual preference and sexual divergence. At the same time, the corpus of human rights has swollen to the point of eruption, with many recent rights claims no longer anchored, as we've already heard, in universal norms of human dignity and human nature, but aired as special interests, special aspirations of particular individuals and particular groups. Marianne Glendon, in her remarks yesterday and in her brilliant book on Rights Talk, has documented that with great acuity. On the one hand, the current ubiquity of the principle of human dignity testifies to its universality. And the constant proliferation of human rights precepts speaks to their power to inspire new hope for many desperate persons and peoples around the globe. Moreover, the increased pervasiveness of these norms is partly a function of emerging globalization, as His Eminence spoke to in his last question in our last session. Since the first international documents on human dignity and human rights were issued, many new voices and values have joined the global dialogue, especially those from Africa and Asia and Latin America, and from various Buddhist and Confucian and Hindu, Islamic and traditional communities. It is simple ignorance to assume that the first international documents were truly universal statements of human dignity and human rights that all the world could embrace in those terms. The views of Western Christians and Jews and Enlightenment-based liberals dominated the conversation. And it is simple arrogance to assume that the 1940s through 1960s were the golden age of human dignity and human rights formulations. Such theological, philosophical, and legal constructions are in need of constant reformation and refinement. The recent challenges of the South and of the East to the prevailing Western paradigm of human dignity and human rights might well be salutary. On the other hand, the very ubiquity of the principle of human dignity today threatens its claim to universality. And the very proliferation of new human rights threatens, to, threatens their long-term effectiveness for doing good. Human dignity needs to be rooted and assign some limits if it is to remain a sturdy foundation for the edifice of human rights. And human rights need to be founded firmly on human dignity, on human nature, and other fundamental ontological principles, lest they devolve into an endless, unmoored gaggle of wishes and wants that have no possible hope of vindication on the ground. The task of defining the appropriate ambit of human dignity and human rights today must be a multidisciplinary, a multi-religious, and a multicultural exercise. Many disciplines, religions, and cultures around the globe have unique sources and resources, texts and traditions that speak to human dignity and human rights in those terms or in analogous terms. 
Some endorse dignity and rights with alacrity and urge their expansion into new areas. Others demur and urge their reform, their restriction, their limitation, their embroidery. It is essential that each community be allowed to speak with its own unique religious voice and accent to work with their own distinctive methods on human dignity and human rights. Joseph Weiler is spot on yesterday in warning against the dangers of reducing it all simply to a public reason with no particular accents given to any distinctive community or culture. But that said, it also is essential that each of these religions and cultures and disciplines develops a capacity for bilingualism building the Rosetta Stones that allow parties to speak with insiders and outsiders alike about their unique understanding of the origin, the nature, and the purpose of human rights and human dignity and the ontological foundations on which they rest. And we've heard brilliant presentations so far from our distinguished colleagues and divines who have opened up the wisdom of Pacham and Taras and looked at the Pacham and Taras as a distillation of a powerful tradition of rights talk and human dignity talk and natural law talk in the Western Catholic tradition. I come to this task as an old-fashioned Protestant armed with the classic theological doctrines of mm, Augsburg and Geneva and Westminster. And my argument is that the Protestant tradition has a deep and distinctive understanding of human dignity, which has had and can have a monumental influence on the understanding of human rights. For classic Protestantism, the essence of human dignity lies in the juxtaposition of human depravity and human sanctity. And the essence of human freedom is our right and our duty to serve God, neighbor, and self alike, and to do so with the ominous assurance of divine judgment. Let me just do a three and a half minute tour of Protestant Anthropology 101 and then talk about the implications of that anthropology for how we think about human rights, equality, and liberty in modern terms. From Martin Luther and John Calvin to Reinhold Niebuhr and Martin Marty, Protestants have long used two dialectics to describe human nature. First, each person is by nature at once a saint and a sinner, righteous and reprobate, saved and lost, simo justus et peccator, in Martin Luther's signature phrase. Second, each person is by office at once a free lord who is subject to no one and a dutiful servant who is subject to everyone. Every Christian has a twofold nature, Protestants insist, in developing this first simo justus et peccator dialectic. We are at once body and soul, flesh and spirit, sinner and saint. As bodily creatures, we are born in sin and bound by sin. By our carnal natures, we are prone to lust, evil, egoism, perversion, and pathos of untold dimensions. Even the best of persons, even the titans of virtue in the Bible, Abraham, David, Peter, and Paul, sin all the time. In and of ourselves, we are depraved and deserving of eternal death. But as spiritual creatures, we are reborn in faith and freed from sin. By our spiritual natures, we are prone to love and charity, goodness and sacrifice, virtue and peacefulness. Even the worst of persons, even the reprobate thief nailed on the cross next to Christ can be saved from sin in spite of ourselves. We are redeemed and assured of eternal life. It's only through faith and hope in the word of God that a person moves from sinner to saint, from bondage to freedom. That is the essence of the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. To put one's faith in the word of God, to accept its gracious promise of eternal salvation, is to claim one's freedom from sin and from its attendant threat of eternal damnation. And it is to join the communion of saints that begins imperfectly in this life and continues perfectly in the life to come. But a saint by faith remains a sinner by nature. And the paradox of good and evil within that same person remains until death. A second feature of human nature 
emphasized by conventional Protestants is that each Christian is at once a Lord who is subject to no one and a priest who is servant to everyone. As a redeemed saint, every Christian is utterly free in his or her conscience, utterly free in his or her innermost being. He's like the greatest king or queen on earth who is above and beyond the power of everyone. No earthly authority, whether pope or prince or parent, can impose a single syllable of the law upon him. No earthly authority can intrude upon the sanctuary of his conscience and danger his assurance and comfort of eternal life. But every Christian is also called to be a priest who freely performs good works in service of his or her neighbor and in glorification of God. As a member of the priesthood of all believers, every Christian freely serves his neighbor, offering instruction, charity, prayer, admonition, and sacrifice even to the point of death. We abide by the law of God so far as we are able, so that others may see our good work and be similarly impelled to seek God's grace. We freely drive and discipline ourselves to do as much good as we are able, not so that we may be saved, but so that others may be served. The precise nature of our priestly service to others depends upon our gifts and upon the vocation in which God calls us to use them. But we are all to serve freely and fully as God's priests of charity. Not everyone who is charitable has faith, but everyone who has faith is charitable. Charity is a form of divine service, of priestly service, whereby God, neighbor, and self are served at once. Such are the paradoxes of human nature in Protestant Anthropology 101. We are at once sinners and saints. We are at once lords and servants. We can do nothing good. We can do nothing but good. We are utterly free. We are everywhere bound. The more a person thinks himself a saint, the more sinful in fact he becomes. The more a person thinks herself a sinner, the more saintly she in fact becomes. The more a person acts like a lord, the more he is called to be a servant. The more a person acts as a servant, the more in fact she has become a lord. This is the paradoxical nature of human life, and this, for Protestants, is the essence of human dignity. These classic theological teachings still shape many Protestants, modern Protestants, instincts about human dignity and human freedom and human rights today. And while they converge with our brothers and sisters in the Catholic and Orthodox and other faith traditions, they bear a distinctive accent that is worthy of emphasis. First, the classic Protestant doctrine that a person is at once sinner and saint renders many Protestants today instinctively skeptical about too optimistic a view of human nature, too ready a reliance on human reason, too easy a conflation of human dignity and human sanctity. Such views take too little account of the radicality of human sin and the perennial necessity of divine grace. They give too little credibility to the inherent human need for discipline and order, accountability and judgment. They give too little credence to the perennial interplay of what Protestants call the civil, theological and educational uses of law, to the perpetual demand to balance deterrence, retribution and reformation in discharging authority within the home, the church, the state, the school and other associations. And they give too little insight into the fundamental necessity for safeguarding every office of authority from abuse and misuse. A theory of human dignity that fails to take into account the combined depravity and sanctity of the human person is theologically deficient and politically dangerous. This cardinal insight into the twofold nature of humanity is readily amenable to many other formulations. Indeed, the classic Protestant formula of Simo Justus et Peccator is a crisp Christian distillation of a universal insight about human nature that can be traced to the earliest Greek and Hebrew sources of the West. The gripping epochs of Homer and Hesiod and Pindar are nothing if not chronicles of the perennial dialectic of good and evil, 
virtue and vice, hero and villain in the ancient Greek world. The very first chapters of the Hebrew Bible paint pictures of these same two human natures, now with Yahweh's imprint upon them. The more familiar picture is that of Adam and Eve, who were created equally in the image of God, invested with a natural right and duty to perpetuate life, to cultivate property, to dress and to keep the garden they've been given. The less familiar picture is that of their first child, Cain, who murdered his brother Abel and was called into judgment by God and condemned for his sin. Yet God put a mark on Cain, Genesis reads, both to protect him in his life and to show, them that, show him that he remained a child of God despite the enormity of his sin. One message of this ancient Hebrew text is that we are not only the beloved children of Adam and Eve who bear the image of God with all of the divine perquisites and privileges of paradise. We are also the sinful siblings of Cain who bear the mark of God with its ominous assurance both that we shall be called into divine judgment for what we have done and that there is forgiveness for the gravest of sins we have committed and confessed. We Christians gather here believe in different ways that it's only through faith and hope in Christ that a person can ultimately be assured of divine forgiveness and eternal salvation. We further believe that it's only through a life of biblical meditation and prayer and worship and charity and sacramental living that a person can hold his or her depravity in check and aspire to greater sanctity. But this is not to say that in this life we Christians have the only insights into the twofold nature of humanity and the only effective means of balancing the realities of human depravity and the aspirations for human sanctity. Any religious tradition that takes seriously the Jekyll and Hyde in all of us has its own understanding of ultimate reconciliation of these two natures and its own methods of balancing them in this life. And those dialectics are what hold us together in our anthropologies. Protestants also believe that the ominous assurance of the judgment of God is ultimately a source of comfort and not of fear. The first sinners in the Bible, Adam, Eve, and Cain, were given divine due process. They were confronted with the evidence, asked to defend themselves, given a chance to repent, spared the ultimate sanction of death, and then assured of a second trial on the day of judgment, with appointed divine counsel, no, yes, no less, Jesus Christ, our advocate before the Father. The only time that the New Testament God deliberately withheld divine due process was in the capital trial of his son. And in Christian teachings, that was the only time it was and has been necessary. The political implications of this are very simple for Protestants. If God gives due process in judging us, we should give due process in judging others. If God's tribunals feature at least basic rules of evidence and procedure and representation and advocacy, human tribunals should feature at least the same. The demand for due process is a deep human instinct and it has driven Protestants over the centuries along with many others before and with them and after them to be strident advocates for human rights. Second, the Protestant doctrine of the lordship and the priesthood of all believers renders many Protestants instinctively jealous about liberty and equality but on their own quite distinct theological terms. In the modern liberal tradition Liberty and equality are generally defended on grounds of popular sovereignty and inalienable rights. The American Declaration of Independence of 1776 proclaimed it a self-evident truth that all men are created equal and are endowed with certain unalienable rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 48 proclaimed that all men are born free and equal in rights and in dignity. Classic Protestants can 
resonate more with the norms of liberty and equality in these documents than with the theories of popular sovereignty and inalienable rights that generally undergirds them. The heart of the Protestant theory of liberty is that we are all lords on this earth. We are utterly free in the sanctuary of our conscience, entirely unencumbered in our relationships with God. We enjoy a sovereign immunity from any human structures and strictures, even those of the church, when they seek to impose upon this divine freedom. Such talk of sovereign immunity sounds something like modern liberal notions of popular sovereignty, and such talk of lordship sounds something like the democratic right to self-rule. And Protestants have thus long found ready allies and liberals and others who advocate liberty of conscience and other democratic freedoms on these grounds. But when theologically pressed, many Protestants will defend liberty of conscience, not because of their own popular sovereignty, but because of the absolute sovereignty of God, whose relationship with his children cannot be trespassed. Many Protestants will defend a number of basic fundamental rights, not in the interest of preserving their personal privacy and autonomy, but in the interest of discharging their divine duties to God and to neighbor. The heart of the Protestant theory of equality is that we are all priests before God. The Bible says many times over, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Among you there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. These and many other biblical passages have been long inspired a reflexive egalitarian impulse in Protestants. All are equal before God. All are priests that must serve their neighbors. All have vocations that count. All have gifts to be included. This common calling of all to be priests transcends differences of culture, economy, gender, and more. Such teachings have led a few Protestant groups over the centuries to experiment with intensely communitarian states of nature where life is purportedly gracious, lovely, and long. But most Protestant groups view life in such states of nature as brutish, nasty, and short, for sin invariably perverts them. Structures and strictures of law and authority are necessary and useful, most Protestants believe. But such structures must be as open, egalitarian, and democratic as possible, with inherent limits built in place alongside the declarations of rights that the citizens enjoy. Hierarchy is a danger to be indulged only so far as necessary. To be sure, Protestants over the centuries have often defied these founding ideals and have earnestly partaken of all manner of elitism and chauvinism and racism and anti-Semitism and tyranny and patriarchy, slavery, apartheid, and so much more. And they have sometimes engaged in outrageous hypocrisy and casuistry to defend such shameful pathos. But an instinct for egalitarianism, for embracing all persons equally, for treating all vocations respectfully, for arranging all associations horizontally, for leveling the life of the earthly kingdom so none is obstructed in access to God, is a Protestant gene in the genetic code of modern democracy and human rights. Third and ever so briefly, um, and finally, the Protestant notion that a person is at once free and bound by the law has powerful implications for our modern understanding of human rights. For Protestants, the Christian is free in order to follow the commandments of the faith. Or in more familiar and general modern parlance, a person has rights in order to discharge duties. Freedoms and commandments, rights and duties belong together in this classic formulation. To speak of one without the other is ultimately destructive of each. Rights without duties to guide them quickly become claims of self-indulgence. Duties without rights to exercise them quickly become sources of deep guilt. Protestants have thus long translated the moral duties set out in the Bible, notably the Decalogue, into reciprocal rights. 
The first table of the Decalogue prescribes duties of love that each person owes to God, to honor God in God's name, to observe the Sabbath day of rest and holy worship, to avoid false gods and false swearing. The second table prescribes duties of love that each person owes to neighbors, to honor one's parents and other authorities, not to kill, to commit adultery, to steal, to bear false witness, to covet. Church, state, and family alike are critically responsible for the communication, the exemplification, and enforcement of these cardinal moral duties, Protestants have long argued. But it's also the responsibility of each person to ensure that he and his neighbors discharge these moral duties. This is one important impetus for Protestants to translate duties into subjective rights. A person's duties toward God can be cast as the rights of religion, the right to honor God in God's name, the right to rest and worship on one Sabbath, the right to be free from false gods and false oaths. Each person's duties toward a neighbor in turn can be cast as a neighbor's right to have that duty discharged. One person's duties not to kill, to commit adultery, to steal, or to bear false witness thus gives rise to another person's rights to life and property, fidelity, and reputation. For a person to insist upon vindication of these latter rights is not necessarily to act out of self-love. It is also to act out of neighborly love. To claim one's own right is in part a charitable act to induce one's neighbor to discharge his or her divinely ordained duties. Thank you so very much.